The first Star Wars film, released in 1977, completely changed the world. I know that sounds a little bit, you know, dramatic, but it's true. What I mean is that there was a world before Star Wars, and there's a world after Star Wars. How did we get to the point in society where a $70 princess dress is socially acceptable? And what did Star Wars do to make that happen? This video will discuss how everyone thought the movie would fail, how Star Wars changed the world, and the ripple effects of Star Wars success. Episode 1, A World Before Star Wars. <laughs> I made my episodes for this video in numerical order, even though the movies were released out of order. No one cares. Episode 1, A World Before Star Wars. Most of the people working on Star Wars, which later became Star Wars 4, A New Hope, thought the movie was a joke. Films were different before Star Wars. Big movies tried to be emotional, thought-provoking, and based in dramatic conflict. After Star Wars, big films tried to be about special effects, franchises, and merchandising. Harrison Ford, who plays Han Solo, said about the film during production, they couldn't quite figure it out. Guy running around in a dog suit and princesses and some guys in tight pants. They laughed at us constantly and thought we were ridiculous. The highest grossing films during a time period highlight the movie going climate. Therefore, the highest grossing films of the year are essentially what society reveres as the most important film of the year, at least culturally, in a mass scale. In 1971, The Fiddler on the Roof was the highest grossing film. If you aren't familiar, The Fiddler on the Roof is this musical and People are talking about losing their community, and it's about identity, and I just give the worst description of Fiddler on the Roof probably ever in recorded history. In 1972, the highest grossing film was The Godfather, and 1973, the highest grossing film was The Exorcist. 1974 is The Towering Inferno. 1975 saw Jaws take the biggest bite out of the box office. I hate what I did there. 1976, highest grossing film was Rocky. Each of the highest grossing films were based in reality in some way or another. The Exorcist was inspired by a real exorcism in 1949. And even Jaws was based off a 1916 shark attack in New Jersey. There had been some sci-fi on TV, but not really in movies. So where did Star Wars, the science fiction, clearly defined good versus evil story fit into all of this, you ask? It didn't. And that's why basically everybody thought Star Wars was going to flop. Episode 2. No one believed in Star Wars. What do Universal Studios and Disney have in common? No, it's not that you can combine the two and make an excellent Central Florida vacation, which is absolutely true. I really need a vacation. What they have in common is that when George Lucas pitched Star Wars to them, they both turned Star Wars down. It's kind of ironic because Disney bought Star Wars through Lucasfilm in 2012. Oh, the irony. Back in the time when popular films were seen as serious and sophisticated. Star Wars was only made because of a serious and sophisticated film that came before it. American Graffiti. American Graffiti was not without its own challenges, but it was a coming-of-age movie made by George Lucas in 1973. The movie fit in with the standard 1970s audience. It was one of those serious, realistic... Sorry, I just fell asleep. I said the word serious way too many times. Anyway, American Graffiti did really well and made a lot of money, and it was released by Universal. So when George Lucas was pitching Star Wars, 20th Century Fox was eventually the film studio to pick up the movie. Reportedly, it wasn't like they believed Star Wars would be a smash hit or anything. Instead, they wanted to have a good relationship with the young and up-and-coming George Lucas. A 20th Century Fox head told George Lucas about Star Wars, I don't understand this, but I loved American Graffiti, and Whatever you do is okay with me. A common theory about the production of Star Wars is that 20th Century Fox was like, hey, this George Lucas guy is a genius, but he has this really stupid sci-fi movie. For networking purposes, let's just let him make it and then he'll make us an American Graffiti later. I don't think from the outside, any of us are ever going to know how much that is true. But the general consensus seems to be that most people did not believe in Star Wars at all. When George Lucas showed cuts of the movie to different peers, nobody really knew what they were looking Looking at. Apparently, there were unfinished action sequences, so we just kind of, you know, put in stock footage of war fights and stuff like that. Everybody who saw it just looked at George like he was an absolute moron, and they were like, George, what have you done? What is this mess? One director, Brian De Palma, apparently said it was, quote, worst movie ever. <laughs> 
after seeing it. That's harsh. You've just made the worst movie ever. I think I'd probably cry and eat some ice cream. I don't know in what order. Maybe at the same time. I don't know. And no test screenings were done with general audiences either, which I'm sure might have changed the opinion of George Lucas. Steven Spielberg believed in George Lucas. He believed in it so much, he actually thought Star Wars would be the biggest movie of all time. George's peers weren't monsters. They wanted to help him out. Brian De Palma, for example, was brutally honest. He gave George feedback, in particular, to simplify the beginning crawl because it was way too complicated when presented to him. Examining the movie they had, George Lucas's wife at the time, Marsha Lucas, assisted with some tweaking. But by the time Star Wars was set to release, George Lucas was convinced the movie would be a flop. George Lucas did what any logical person would do in his situation. He ran away to Hawaii with Steven Spielberg to escape all of his problems. Episode 3, The Other Side of Midnight. Many theaters did not want to show Star Wars. They, like everyone, thought the movie was going to flop, and most theaters were not willing to spare a screen. To understand why, let's take a look at movie theaters in the 1970s. We have megaplexes now, which weren't really a thing until the 1990s. Back then, what was being shown was largely based on a movie theater's individual discretion. In the mid to late 1970s, six screen movie theaters were being built, but that was about the largest that movie theaters were willing to go. Many movie theaters were two or three screens, and the summer was the busiest time for theaters. With such limited capacity, who wanted to give up a precious screen to a film that was thought to flop? Star Wars was an expensive movie, costing $11 million at the time. 20th Century Fox didn't wholly believe in the movie, but it wasn't completely dismissed. The movie was promoted, but more so with a niche audience, aka comic book people. They were excited for it, but nobody else was. So overall, theaters just did not want to show Star Wars. 20th Century Fox had another movie, an R rated film called The Other Side of Midnight, which was projected to be the biggest film of the summer. It was smart, sophisticated, thought-provoking. You know what I'm talking about. It was said to come out a few weeks after Star Wars, and 20th Century Fox said to theaters, if you want to show The Other Side of Midnight, you have to show Star Wars. That way, Star Wars at least had a chance of being seen. So on May 25th, 1977, the day we commemorate as the birth of Star Wars, Star Wars, later known as Star Wars A New Hope, opened on a total of a whopping 32 screens. Just 32. Theaters really, really did not want to show this movie. Star Wars opened on a Wednesday, and by the weekend, 43 screens were showing the movie. But I mean, 43 screens across the United States of America. I mean, that's, that's bad. How many of them had faith in Star Wars, and how many of them just wanted to show the other side of midnight? No idea. All the while, George Lucas was in Hawaii with Steven Spielberg, and he had no idea what was going on at all. Episode 4, George Lucas runs away from his problems. Kind of. You know, I think we can all take a lot of inspiration from George Lucas when it comes to the Star Wars release. If everything is going wrong in your life, simply go to Hawaii. In that case, I should probably just move to Hawaii personally. That would just, you know, simplify the problem. Nobody cares. The point is, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas were in Hawaii. No theaters in Hawaii were showing Star Wars opening weekend. I don't know if that was coincidental, but George Lucas was pretty far away from a galaxy far, far, far away. Pretty far away from a galaxy far, far away. As far as George Lucas knew, the movie was flopping. He had no updates at all. I can just imagine the visual of George Lucas and Steven Spielberg in their younger years, jumping in the waves, just you know, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, oh, the ocean. All the while, there's a few theaters and the Death Star is blowing up and people are freaking out. And George and Steven are just there jumping through the earth. What makes this scenario a lot less fun is that apparently George Lucas goes on vacation every time he has a movie open. He wasn't just running away to Hawaii because he thought the movie would flop, but Hawaii helps ease emotional pain. I guess. So George Lucas is on the beach, not asking for updates. He doesn't know what's going on. And once the movie's been out for a week, he got a call from 20th Century Fox executive Alan Ladd Jr., who actually believed in Star Wars and was like, George, you need to turn on the news now. And what George Lucas found to his surprise was that a week after Star Wars release, it had gone viral. I mean, you can't go viral in the 70s. It was everywhere, you know? The movie was playing all across the nation. People were lining up to see the movie across the block. Can you imagine? You think this movie's flopping, you're sending your buns, and then you get a call to turn on the TV, and oh my gosh. What?
Episode 5, The Film is a Success. The first way Star Wars changed culture was through its merchandise. Yeah, I know it's kind of weird. Filmmakers make a great film. They have a logo. Somebody slaps that logo on a t-shirt. Somebody buys that t-shirt. And that t-shirt changes the world. It's a lot more than that, though. Before Star Wars came out, George Lucas was given a choice. Either he could have $500,000 and 20th Century Fox would have everything. Or he could take a pay cut and have the rights to Star Wars sequels and its merchandising. This might have been a tale of woe for George Lucas if he took the $500,000 and left everything else to 20th Century Fox. Fox, but I mean, George Lucas is fine. He's fine. George Lucas is fine. George initially licensed comic book rights to Marvel and licensed toys to a company named Kenner. Kenner secured the rights to Star Wars merchandising one month before the film was released. One month. It takes quite a while to prepare for merchandising of a film. Kenner, though, apparently wasn't too worried. Movie merchandise really wasn't a thing back then. Before Star Wars, film studios and toy makers really did not collaborate that much. I'm assuming Kenner thought they'd make a few toys, they might sell for a few weeks, when it was over they had some money. I mean, it really wasn't gonna be a big deal. And especially with everybody thinking the movie was gonna flop, but oh, oh were they wrong. No movie ever had merchandise demand like that before. Toys specifically. Needless to say, Kenner only made a moderate amount of merchandise for Star Wars. Christmas of 1977 was approaching and there was no way they were gonna have toys by then. They needed to figure something out and fast. So for the Christmas of 1977, Kenner ended up selling mail away early bird packages. If you pre-bought toys, well, you know, they made them. Then you got this card for the Christmas of 1977, which were then later redeemed in the spring of 1977. 78 for actual Star Wars toys. I can't imagine being a little kid at Christmas and wanting a Star Wars toy and getting an IOU card. But we have to ask ourselves the question, why was merchandise so important with Star Wars when it really hadn't been before? And how did Star Wars kick off a trend with merchandise and major film releases? Episode 6, why was Star Wars so popular? Star Wars had a 19 year old protagonist, a simple story with an optimistic tone released during a tense time. The mid 1970s were not an optimistic time in the United States of America. Political tensions were high, gas prices were high, people were high, strong. You know, then Star Wars burst into theaters in 1977. People watching Star Wars felt something. Optimistic, unapologetic fun. 1. Younger protagonists. Movies with younger protagonists often relate to mass audiences, so when a protagonist is an older teen, like the case with Star Wars, audience members the age of the character see them as a peer. Younger audiences see them as a role model, and older audiences remember what it was like to be that age, just as long as the children or teenagers aren't specifically written for children or teenagers. Think about the first Harry Potter movie. If he were, say, building a mega looping Hot Wheels down the stairs of Hogwarts, older audiences would not be able to relate because it would not be about youthful emotions at that point. It would be about actual kids doing actual kid things, which actually, you know, I'd pay to see that movie. Like, you know, if the staircases change and the Hot Wheel cart, they could just fall. Nobody cares. The point is, the age of the protagonist does not determine the target audience. The way that protagonist is written determines the target audience. And a younger protagonist, when written right, can really open a movie up to all ages, such as with Star Wars. Two, simple story. The first Star Wars film was a simple story set in a complex world. Simple does not mean stupid. Simple is actually a good thing oftentimes. Simple media, from my observation, is really defined by two elements. The first element is clearly defined good and bad guys. And the second, when applicable, is the fear of death over physical or emotional pain. The truth is, nobody sees themselves as the bad guy. And if we're doing something that's negative towards somebody else, we've typically justified it to the point where we view ourselves as the good guy and other people as the bad guy. So simpler media like Star Wars 4, where the bad guys dress in black and have red lightsabers, makes abundantly clear who is good and who is bad. The real world isn't that simple though, and everyone knows it. People typically see others as a mixture of good and bad, good, or just bad, yet we see ourselves as good. So when it's clearly defined who is good and bad on screen, it's really relatable on an individual level, which then becomes relatable on a mass scale. Two real life enemies with pretty different worldviews could both be in the same screening of Star Wars and see themselves in Luke Skywalker because they project their own self-imposed views of their own goodness into the movie. The viewer is good, 
Luke Skywalker is good. Their actual enemies are bad. Darth Vader is bad. They're not rationalizing or sympathizing with the villain or doubting the hero. And that's what makes simpler media extremely powerful. Star Wars really tapped into this, which wasn't something a lot of movies were doing in the 1970s. 3. Optimism Happier media tends to thrive in times of uncertainty. During the Great Recession, happier dance pop kind of top the charts. I'm assuming happier media is going to make a strong comeback. I think it's starting actually. A lot of people are miserable generally <laughs> right now at the time of this recording. The highest grossing film of 2022 was Top Gun Maverick, which like Star Wars A New Hope features an overly optimistic, simplistic plot clearly defined good and bad guys. We don't see Top Gun Maverick having a merchandise explosion. And I believe above all else that's because Top Gun Maverick is way too similar to our world to really stand out. Episode 7, Why People Buy Merchandise. The Taurus gaze is fundamental in understanding Star Wars, merchandise, and how Star Wars impacted culture. Essentially, the Taurus gaze is the notion that Taurus are directed toward a main subject that differs from their regular life, hence the Taurus gaze. If you see an ad for Disney World, for example, you're going to see Cinderella Castle. Let's say you go to Magic Kingdom Park at Walt Disney World. When you go through the entry plaza and walk down Main Street USA, Cinderella Castle sits at the end of the street. The tourist gaze will direct you towards the site. You'll pass by the flagpole, clock, the window displays, and all the shops because you were sold the idea of Cinderella Castle. And a flagpole, a clock, and a window display are too similar to what you see in your day-to-day -day life to really make an impact. And that moment when you finally make it to the castle, that castle is... Disney World. To make it important, you need that moment to matter. But you can't take the moment with you. You're left with one of two options. Option one, take a picture in front of the castle. People don't really know why they take photos in front of things and why they all smash their faces together and then immediately run away when the moment's over because like, you don't normally do that in your real life. You're just doing that for a picture. Taking a picture turns that fleeting moment into something tangible, even if your photo is digital. Or option two, you can commemorate the feeling with merchandise. The merchandise itself can't replicate the moment, just like the picture itself can't replicate the moment. But merchandise gives you something physical that represents the moment. You can also get a free souvenir from your vacation, like a rock. But that's not the point of this video. So we have this mass psychological phenomenon where people want to solidify intangible moments moments. I just used a lot of big words. Sorry. For years, this phenomenon has existed within tourist spaces in the form of photographs and souvenirs, but Star Wars cultural impact began a shift where this same phenomenon was applied to movies. So if somebody in 1977 was trying to capture that feeling of seeing Star Wars, they could not take a picture in the movie theater. I mean, they could, but it'd be really weird to take a picture of yourself standing in front of a movie screen. The other people in the movie theater might get mad. Like, I don't think that would go for it. So merchandise is the only option that's left. But with big films of the past, people didn't necessarily feel the need to quantify their experience in terms of merchandise because what they saw on screen more or less reflected their reality. I'm being extremely broad here. Let's look at an example of a film pre-Star Wars. Jaws was a huge film when it came out in 1975. Huge! There's not much about Jaws that's super unique to our world, except for the shark obviously. But something like Cinderella Castle, well, that's different from our everyday lives. But regarding Jaws, the world itself is too ordinary, even if the story is great. The whole thing's on a beach and in the ocean, something that a lot of people in the audience have seen. But there really wasn't that tourist gaze effect for most viewers. Even to this day, the only Jaws merchandise you're ever really gonna see is gonna be the Jaws logo on a t-shirt, maybe something of the shark. But Star Wars did something different. It exposed audiences to larger-than-life characters that extended beyond any of our realities and places and objects to which your attention was directed. R2-D2, lightsabers, the Millennium Falcon, 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 whatever. Compared to a big film like Jaws where the climax takes place in a fishing boat, Star Wars was spectacular. And at that time, people wanted to make those extraordinary feelings matter in the same exact way that tourists want to make their travel experiences matter. And moviegoers did this with Star Wars merchandise. Star Wars was really the pioneer of movie merchandise. So a lot of the early merchandise were toys aimed at children. Modern merchandise really targets all sectors. While researching for this video, I even found R2-D2 bedsheets and an R2-D2 toaster. I'm not buying those, it's, it's kind of, um, 
It's kind of expensive. Merchandise isn't just limited to the extraordinary. It's not like only science fiction and fantasy movies are going to sell merchandise, but it seems to be at a whole different level. But Star Wars exposed and normalized merchandise for a wide variety of things, especially movie franchises. Even things that you don't think would necessarily need merchandise have merchandise now, like YouTubers. It might seem silly if you don't have an emotional connection from watching a YouTuber's video, but when people buy a t-shirt from a YouTuber, they don't actually care about the t-shirt. They're trying to solidify that emotional attachment they have from watching the YouTuber into something tangible. If I ever do well on YouTube, I would absolutely sell t-shirts with my face on it. Maybe not my, I mean, I don't know if I want my face on a t-shirt. I, I don't, I, anyway. Star Wars merchandise reportedly made a hundred million dollars between the years of 1977 and 1978. Merchandise for a big film could be much more profitable than the film itself at the box office. And before Disney purchased Star Wars in 2012, it's reported over Overall, that Star Wars toys made 3 billion, video games made 3.5 billion, book sales were 2 billion, licensing deals were 1.3 billion. <gasps> Wait. Wait, that's a whole list. That's still a lot. In comparison, the first six Star Wars films made 4.3 billion dollars. So merchandise made 9.8 billion dollars. And the movies made 4.3 billion dollars, supposedly. I mean, those are the numbers I could find online, so whatever. So many things have merchandise lines now. From Disney princesses to the Kardashians. The Kardashians. We can thank George Lucas for the Kardashian. Okay, that's a stretch, but you know what I mean. Episode 8, Movie Franchises. The original Star Wars trilogy was comprised of three films, hence the name trilogy. Anyway, it was a series. It kind of appears like different film studios saw the success of Star Wars and they thought to themselves, let's have one of those. So a few films tried to copy Star Wars in the late 1970s. They didn't stick with audiences the same way Star Wars did because they didn't really understand what made Star Wars successful. And all the special effects and worlds and, and everything just were there to serve a bigger story. Eventually, movie studios figured franchises out, mostly. A moment of silence for John Carter. Over the years, studios have experimented with original content and franchises. And in the end, especially recently, franchises have taken the cake. A poll taken in 2021 reveals that 53% of adults would rather see a prequel or sequel, and 47% would rather see original stories. What's interesting about this, however, is that box office data suggests otherwise. At the top level, people tend to see movies about characters and worlds they already know. There's a lot of factors that go into this, but just for the sake of general example, let's take a look at the highest grossing animated films of all time. Eight of the ten are sequels, or a remake. Only two, the original Frozen and Zootopia, were new ideas. Frozen was another film in the Disney Princess line, and Zootopia was advertised as the next great film from Disney Animation Studios. They weren't necessarily marketed like other completely original films. If we take a look at the top ten movies for live action, only two Two were original ideas, Avatar and Titanic. Which, to be fair, we all knew what the Titanic was before. You know, because it was famous. Avatar stands out as original, though. Say what you want, but Avatar is extremely original. And most of these franchises are science fiction or fantasy. After Star Wars, studios eventually figured out how audiences really react with merchandise and film. A lot of times you see a big movie and you're like, yeah, that's gonna be merchandise. You know what I'm talking about? Currently, we're in an era where a lot of film studios are focused on these big franchises because they know they'll work and they know their merchandise will work. Here are some numbers I was able to find. At the time of this recording, the two Frozen films, for example, have made 3.73 billion at the box office and their merchandise line has made a reported 10.58 billion. The three Cars films have made 2.7 billion and its merchandise line has made 19.11 billion. Batman movies movies have made 6.8 billion at the box office, but 21.8 billion in merchandise. And this all started with the footprint of Star Wars. Star Wars changed the world because it changed the direction of movies. And it also introduced the idea of merchandise. Really, because that audience demand was there for it. And merchandise can be a part of our everyday lives in a way 
that a movie cannot. It's not just fantasy on the screen. It is seeped into our actual lives. Star Wars stuff is everywhere. We see it on people's clothes, in people's houses. It's become so much more important in society than just a movie that everybody saw because the merchandise is everywhere. And when additional titles come out within a media franchise, people trust the media franchise because they have an established relationship with it. And a lot of that relationship has been solidified through the constant bombardment of merchandise. So is this a good or bad thing? I'll let you decide. Episode 9, me. <laughs> My personal experience with Star Wars is really unique, and while we're all gathered here today, I wanted to share it. I was pretty unfamiliar with Star Wars when I was 20 years old. I'd seen 1, 2, and 3 in theaters, but I was really little, and I'd never seen 4, 5, and 6. I worked at Disney World as a character performer one summer, and the next summer, I ended up getting in merchandise, specifically Star Wars merchandise. So I worked in this store called Tatooine Trade which was at the exit of the Star Tours attraction. At that time, Galaxy's Edge was not a thing. The Star Wars store was really the central hub. And immediately, we started Star Wars Weekends, which was like a super fan event. And my coworkers were telling me, all right, Jameson, people are going to go into the Star Wars store during the Star Wars event, and they're going to expect you to know Star Wars. I was so intimidated by Star Wars weekends. I put on my nicest clothes, marched into HR, and asked if I could be a performer again. And they were like, no, Jameson, you have to do the merchandise thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to figure out Star Wars. I couldn't find the movies anywhere, and I was also a poor college student, so I ended up just reading every single article I could find on the plot, the worlds, and the different characters. I'm really glad HR didn't let me switch departments, honestly. I was a performer again two years later, and working in the Star Wars store was one of the best experiences of my life. What I realized while working those Star Wars weekends is that it's not like everybody had just watched, you know, every single movie just before Star Wars weekend. Some of the people hadn't seen the movies in years. But with movies and things, it's about how that piece of media makes you feel. Because once you've seen the movie a while ago and it kind of fades away, what you're left with is the feeling, even if you don't remember any of the words spoken. After leaving that area, I was really afraid to see the original trilogy because my experience of really being in the Star Wars environment and stuff like that was so positive, I was afraid that actually seeing the original trilogy would kind of completely ruins my perception of what I've built it up to be in my head. So, you know, eventually I did watch it. Yeah. Obviously, I liked it. I made this video. <laughs> when Disney started making Star Wars 7, they released an open casting call to play the leads or whatever. Obviously, nobody knew anything, and I submitted a tape. I was like, I look like Luke Skywalker. I could be his child. I mean, we're both short. That's, that's about all the similarities we have. What I love most about Star Wars is the way that it, it brings people together. And I was really grateful that even though I was just working in a merchandise store, for a moment, I was able to be part of that in some way. I can break Star Wars down into the specific elements of, you know, the simpler story, the good versus evil, the merchandise. But at the end of the day, it's really about how the movies make people feel. And I'm sure it's made all of us feel very good in some certain way. If you want to know how movie ratings changed over time, click on this video next.